Hey, good morning, everybody. Meteorologist Jim Dickey back with you for another edition of Tropics Talk. So much to talk about here this morning, so let's get right to it. Of course, we're still tracking Fiona, still tracking Gaston, and now new to the game, Tropical Depression 9 formed overnight in the Central Caribbean Sea. That same system we've been tracking all week long. Now, most of this I'm going to focus in on Tropical Depression 9. I'm a meteorologist in Southwest Florida, so I'm going to focus in on the potential impacts here from that storm. I do want to briefly touch on Fiona, though. If you're just looking for uh, the discussion on Tropical Depression 9, skip ahead about a minute, minute and a half in the video, and I'll get right to that. But there's Fiona, the 8 o'clock advisory, 125 mile per hour winds, holding the major hurricane strength, but a little bit weaker. There's Bermuda on the southeastern side of the storm. So yes, you did miss a direct landfall in Bermuda, but still being lashed by wind and rainfall here this morning as the storm pulls away quickly to the north northeast at 25 miles per hour on a beeline for Atlantic Canada as you look at the Kona concern forecast this will zoom up northward by 2 a.m. tomorrow morning so in less than 24 hours this will be making landfall in Nova Scotia potentially still as a category three hurricane like I've been telling you this could be one of the strongest hurricane landfalls to ever occur in Nova Scotia I think the only question is whether or not it makes that transition to a non-tropical low prior to or after landfall. I mean, look at these winds. We're talking hurricane force winds on the western side of Newfoundland all, all the way up towards the Isle of Labrador. 100 plus mile per hour winds across the eastern side of Nova Scotia. This is going to knock down trees. This is going to cause widespread power outages. There'll be flooding rainfall and along with that storm surge, especially on the eastern side of the track of the low. So quite an impact there to Atlantic Canada here this weekend. And now we jump southward into the Caribbean and there is Tropical Depression 9. A fairly healthy looking little Tropical Depression this morning. So what's changed over the last 24 hours? The thunderstorm activity has really been able to sustain itself on the western side of the storm. The center is still right about here. This time yesterday this was just a disorganized mass of thunderstorms in a broad rotation. It has really flared up those storms and has kept them organized with that low-level center being detected. Uh, the Hurricane Center went ahead and upgraded this to Tropical Depression 9. The question today, how quickly does this thunderstorm activity try to wrap itself back around the center? When that happens, that's when intensification will really start to take off. Uh, so what are sort of the early takeaways here from this storm system? Again, of course, it's form. That's the big change overnight. Uh, the models have really shifted in the last 24 hours too. A number of models yesterday were showing this headed towards the central western Gulf of Mexico. Just about every model you look at now has shifted to show more of an impact on the Florida Peninsula, central or south Florida. And uh, tough to say anything else, but direct impacts are likely from this storm in southwest Florida now as we go into next week. Not listed here too, the timing has picked up an earlier arrival time. Yesterday we were talking Thursday, maybe Friday. A faster moving storm means timing wise we're looking uh, more of the Tuesday to Wednesday time frame with this. Here's the initial Kona concern forecast showing a tropical storm forming later today, taking the name Hermine in all likelihood unless uh, the little low moving off the coast of Africa takes that first, then it would be Ian, but Hermine in all likelihood moving to the west, then the northwest and uh, intensifying in a big way a hurricane by early Monday morning. And the first forecast here from the Hurricane Center shows a Category 2 storm, a high-end Category 2 storm, just on the verge of becoming a major hurricane close to or over us here in Southwest Florida. A couple of things to unpack. The fact that the Hurricane Center went all the way to the edge of major hurricane strength, Category 3 intensity, uh, it tells you what you need to know about the potential for this to intensify. And we'll talk about that in just a moment, but this, at the very least, is likely going to be a hurricane as it approaches Florida. When you look at the Kona Concern forecast, the Hurricane Center is plotting out, is forecasting the central path, yes, but then they fit this cone over it, and the cone is developed by looking at uh, the average forecast error over the last five years. History tells you that the center of the storm will track within the cone two-thirds of the time, and it tells you that the center could be anywhere from out here in the western Gulf of Mexico by five days out, which is this last time step, or out here in the Bahamas. There's about a 200 mile error in the track forecast from the Hurricane Center uh, at 120 hours or five days out. So yes, you see that center line cutting right through southwest Florida right now. That doesn't mean that's necessarily locked in stone. 
on the table, certainly, but not necessarily locked in stone. I, I think what is fairly certain at this point, though, is that this will be a fairly strong and potentially intensifying storm as it nears the area. So right now, we talked about how the storms are displaced from the center. It's because of the wind shear. Those northeasterly winds on the backside, really, of Fiona have helped to shear this and keep it weak to this point. It's developed nonetheless. But you can see those colors. Those are showing you the various wind shear levels. The high wind shear right now is uh, right over it. Once it gets to about... Uh, the southwestern side of Haiti and begins to uh, make a pass to the south of Jamaica. The wind shear is basically going to go away entirely. The upper level uh, conditions are going to become more or less ideal for this to intensify and potentially rapidly intensify. Take a look at the ocean heat content this is headed into and that's sort of the most energy that a tropical storm or hurricane would have to work with to gain strength uh, that we find anywhere in the Atlantic Basin here right now. Very deep, warm water that this will sort of use as rocket fuel. So it's no surprise when you look at the different models and their different forecast intensities that just about everything shows this ramping up quickly, at least to Category 2 intensity. A few of the hurricane models, those are models that are specifically fine-tuned to look at hurricane formation, the h mom we call it the H-Wharf, both showing a Category 4 high-end Category 4 hurricane. Now, is that locked in? Absolutely not. Uh, and those models, too, do tend to really ramp up in intensity uh, more so than others and are often erroneous in doing so. But it's a signal that rapid intensification is on the table and uh, a very strong storm could be approaching Florida by the time we get to the middle of next week. Now, of course, if you were watching yesterday, the GFS was way out here. You see where that one run ago is way out here near the Yucatan. Look at how this has shifted over the last 12 hours. The green is the latest forecast. Uh, these are isobars and lines of equal pressure. That bullseye over the Florida Gulf Coast uh, is uh, where the center of the latest run would be, right around Sarasota, Bradenton. Yeah, clearly, this has been a massive shift about 500 miles east in the last 12 hours of model run. So why is that? The first reason is that uh, even the GFS now is showing a much more quickly moving storm. Meaning, as this begins to move into the Western Caribbean on Monday, it starts to feel that pull of that trough that's in the Northeast at this point in time. Runs yesterday, we're moving this more slowly. It didn't really feel that pull of the trough and it allowed it to go into the central Gulf of Mexico. A faster moving storm gets yanked northward. That's by that sort of red area you see. There's a front draping down the East Coast at this point. That provides a northerly lift to the storm, turning it across Cuba and towards Florida. And, uh, you know, one model in particular that has been dead set on that type of track has been the European forecast model. This is looking at also a 12-hour gap in different model runs. You don't see the same type of spread, that's for sure. It shows the center of uh, the, uh, the storm in the latest run over the Keys at 8 o'clock Tuesday evening. One run ago, right over the Everglades <clears throat> on uh, Tuesday evening. But not a lot of spread there. That's... Uh, a pretty good model consistency run to run. The uh, Euro Ensemble has been locked in all along here too, so you can say a little more confidence in that solution. So why is the European forecast model going further eastward? Why is it gone further eastward all along? This is looking at the vorticity, a sort of spin in the atmosphere. So where you see that deep red area south of Jamaica, this would be Sunday evening or uh, Saturday evening, early Sunday. Uh, it's the center is sitting just to the south and east of Jamaica. Note that area of green sitting across Cuba and to the south. That's an upper level low pressure area. The European has really been locking into that being a factor here and having it uh, a little higher amplitude, giving a kick to the north, pulling it further northward a little more quickly. The GFS yesterday barely even had that showing up. Again, that allowed the storm to track a little further to the west, a little more slowly. Didn't have that jog to the north. It missed the trough. It went to the central Gulf of Mexico. Look what the GFS is doing now. It has that same dip. It has that same area of spin, of vorticity, uh, south and west of Cuba, that same upper level low that does drag this further to the north, which is why that Model 2 is now showing a track into Florida. So there again is your Kona concern. As I see it, three scenarios in play right now, and I'm... Not, it's not the question we could bring additional scenarios as the models shift over the next 24 hours, but we'll talk about the eastern side of the cone, the western side of the cone, and a solution right up the center. So let's begin with what the European forecast model has been suggesting, at least the operational European. A track across South Florida, 
perhaps into Collier County, mainland Monroe, out Miami-Dade, into the Atlantic. For us in southwest Florida, and that's what these impacts are representing, I'm not talking about what could happen in, say, Tampa or Miami. I'm focusing on southwest Florida. Uh, the worst impacts would be in Collier County, as far as the winds and the rain are concerned. This would bring a lower storm surge threat to us. As we talk about storm surge, you can see how the winds flow around that low pressure area. For us to have those onshore winds that provide a dangerous storm surge, you'd want it, uh, to see the low passing to your west that brings the onshore winds, that brings the, the potential of the storm surge uh, to move its way onshore. This would mean less rainfall too. Anytime you can be on the western side of a tropical storm or hurricane versus an eastern side, uh, you will definitely take that. The eastern side is what we call the messy or sloppy side of a hurricane. It's where the heaviest of the rains tend to be. It's where the highest flooding threat tends to be. Again, we talked about it. It's where the storm surge threat is, uh, and it's uh, where the threat for tornadoes would be too. So the European forecast model is pretty much in line with that. So this is what that would look like in the latest model run. It shows hurricane force winds, Collier County, Hendry County. It shows tropical storm force winds across the rest of the area, but this would obviously be less of an impact than some other scenarios I'm about to lay out for you. Of note too, the European forecast model appears to be underdone in its intensity. It moves more quickly, so perhaps it means there's not as much time for it to intensify, but it also has a bias to sort of show storms a little bit weaker, especially in the longer range. So I think you could safely add about 10 to 15 onto these numbers to get a more realistic idea of what the wind gusts would be like if a storm were to cut uh, through uh, South Collier, Monroe into Miami-Dade. And here's the rain totals. A broad two to six inches of rain, especially in our northern areas, dry air would sweep in and that would shut down the rain totals uh, into uh, parts of Charlotte and DeSoto County. So the rain wouldn't be as impactful either, although still big impact in interior Collier, interior Glades and Hendry by Lake Okeechobee. Here's a second scenario. This is what's playing out in the GFS right now. A path that takes this into the Big Bend or in and around Tampa still be a significant impact for us here in southwest Florida. Tropical storm force winds, heavy rain, the threat for tornadoes, perhaps multiple tornadoes, and then coastal flooding and even, yes, storm surge. A slow-moving large storm like this would be would still bring a long period of onshore winds and would still likely cause some storm surge even if we avoided a direct landfall in our area. You can think of this one as you think back uh, to uh, 2020, what Ada did as it swung by in southwest Florida. You have to think to yourself too, that was a borderline category one hurricane. Ada would sort of be the floor of what we could expect impact wise. It would likely be worse than that, but something overall similar. There's the wind gusts on the American model, which follows a path similar to that. Uh, 60 to 100 mile per hour winds across much of the area. Lesser winds in Collier, get closer to the center, the stronger your winds are going to be. So the center goes all the way to Tampa. The winds aren't going to be as bad in our southern areas. And then the rain would be much heavier in this case. It would be on the eastern side of the storm. We'd likely be in some long-lasting rain bands. These totals would probably be underdone, but I think we'd be talking four to eight inches of rain across much of the area and a much higher threat for flooding. And then there's, of course, on the table, the worst-case scenario, a direct hit, a track right into southwest Florida as a major hurricane. Hurricane force winds across the area, widespread power outages that could last for days, if not weeks, heavy rain. There should be the threat for tornadoes a dangerous storm surge if this say we talk about it going into hurricane season every year what we look for the worst case scenario for storm surge a slow moving large major hurricane going in around sarasota definitely on the table here this could be worst case scenario storm surge if it were to take that type of track again we're still five days out there's still lots of uncertainty and lots to unpack uh, to unpack rather as far as exactly where this is going to go and in this case Exactly where that center goes is going to very much determine what impacts we see here in southwest Florida. But I think at this point, it's safe to say we will see some impacts from this storm as we go into next week. The timing has sped up. We're talking Tuesday into Wednesday, which means you have the entire weekend and the weather looks pretty good to sort of get yourself together. Make sure you have your hurricane plan set and ready to execute if needed. Make sure your hurricane kit is stocked up. Hey, if you don't need those extra supplies, we still have two months of hurricane season to go that you could need them down the line. Better safe than sorry, right? And again, be sure you're staying tuned to the forecast. We're going to be tracking this thing for you 24-7 here at ABC7. We'll have the latest on air and online for you uh, as this storm approaches. Until next time, I'm meteorologist Jim Dickey. Stay safe out there.